Okay, guys, let's get started. Grab a seat. All right. Uh, so we're super excited today. We have a guest lecturer, uh, Dr. Ethan Zhang from VoltDB. Uh, he holds a PhD in, in computer science from the University of Houston, and he's currently the lead engineer at VoltDB. Um, they're also giving a uh, research talk later today at 4.30 in Gates. If, you're, if you can't get enough Volt VoltDB, uh, then you can come to that. So full disclosure, uh, when I was in grad school doing my PhD, I worked on a system called HDOR, which he's going to talk about today. And around 2008, they took my code, forked it, removed all my, all my profanity uh, in the comments, and then that became VoltDB. So that's sort of the background, and we're super excited to have him <laughs> talk about that, that effort. How, how do we remove his, your, your comments? <laughs> it's, yeah, so the, not only did he remove it, he had to scrub it from like, the Git history as well. Because it, you don't, yeah. All right. Leave it at that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so on the way out, uh, Ten Yu and Lin will be handing out the coupons. So make sure you pick up uh, that, and you can only get one. Okay? All right. Go for it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Andy. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to visit CMU and see all you guys here uh, in Andy's database course. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ethan. Uh, I'm a software engineer from VoDB. Uh, we are I lead a small agile development team working on VoDB's um, query execution engine. Um, on the screen are my contact information, my email, LinkedIn, WeChat, whatever you want. Uh, feel free to contact me with any of your comments or questions or feedbacks or uh, even real resumes. I'm also hiring interns for um, summer 2019. Um, here as well is my uh, colleague, uh, Ruth Morgenstein. Um, uh, she's the VP of Engineering of VoDB, and I bet she also has uh, many interesting stories to share, especially if we want to talk about some career topics like women in engineering. Um, definitely, I'm not qualified to talk about that. Um, all right, so today all my stories are about HStore. Um, HStore project is a collaboration among researchers from several universities, um, like MIT, Brown, SMU. Um, so it sets forth a specialization of a database for fast transactions. And HStore was commercialized as VoDB in 2009. And since then, both systems evolved a lot in their respective realms, namely um, the academia and the industry. So um, today, we will start from the academia. I will talk about the uh, VoDB history, what motivated VoDB, and then uh, some design uh, decisions, how we made them. And then I will give you an architectural overview of this uh, original system that we built. Uh, following that, we'll set our fit into the industrial world, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that we had to change after we started shipping VoDB to uh, real customers. And in the final part of my talk, I'm going to come back to academia again, and we're going to talk about very briefly uh, some of the more recent research work followed the HStore project uh, after HStore and VoDB diverged. So um, let's get started. Um, if you follow the Michael Stonebreaker history, uh, one of his core ideas was to build specialized systems to solve specific problems. For instance, if you want to be uh, really good at OLAP, uh, you want to run uh, long-running queries, you want to run uh, read-only queries, um, complex joins, or exploratory queries like OLAP cubes, you want to drill down and roll up and slice and dicing. Um, the system you should be looking for is systems like CStore or um, the Vertica project. Um, Vertica was this idea that um, if I build a um, system with some special designs, like I use column store rather than row store, I use some data compression uh, mechanism, et cetera, um, just for uh, doing analytics, not as a gen general purpose system, can I run 10 times faster or 50 times faster? The answer was yes. Uh, and that project came up to be a uh, academic and a commercial success. So um, those bunch of people then turned their head to sort of the other half of the question. Now we solved analytics, can we do better transaction processing? So uh, one of the specific questions they asked was, uh, what kind of system can I build if your data fits in memory? Um, you may become suspicious about this because um, living in the world with some giant companies like Google, Facebook, those may be a reality distortion. Um, but in reality, a lot of the data sets do fit in memory. Um, 
<coughs> for example, um, the, the TPCC uh, benchmark is one of the benchmarks that we use for um, well TP workloads. Um, it simulates a uh, warehouse order processing situation. And the largest the data set in uh, TPCC, the warehouse, uh, actually each warehouse got only 100 megabytes of data. And if you own a business that has, let's say, you time this by 1,000, you have 1,000 such warehouses that only goes to like 100 gigabytes, which can still easily fit into the main memory into this cluster environment. And actually, VoDB now has customers that go uh, with data at scale of terabytes. So you, a lot of data sets can fit in memory. So um, with that, how do you figure out that problem? Um, so what they did was they took a uh, legacy system, one that was open source, and they shoved it to the uh, RAM disk and measured where did it spend its time. So you know, when you run a um, disk-oriented system on the RAM, it's definitely going to make it faster but it won't run like 50 times faster, right? You, if you have MySQL and I give it a uh, huge memory cache, that doesn't make MySQL an in-memory database out of the box. Um, so uh, it, it won't run as fast as the RAM makes it, right? So um, let's just take a look um, where um, does a legacy system spend its time. So uh, one of the things that's taking a significant amount of time is the uh, buffer manager. But that problem is very easy to solve because uh, we said uh, we assume that your data fits in memory and you don't necessarily have to use a disk to st uh, store all your data. You can get rid of that disk storage and store all your data in memory. Then you don't have uh, that buffer pool and don't need to have a buffer manager. So that problem is kind of solved. You cut it off. Um, so the next big issue that's problematic is dealing with concurrency. So there are two aspects to that. To that. Um, the first is uh, to um, have shared memory access. Um, then you need to have like concurrent data structure, like concurrent B trees, which incurs a lot of overhead with all those mutexes and logs. Um, the other aspect is actually the logical logs um, for uh, transaction management. Like um, we covered in the course, you, you know we have like row-level locking or table-level locking or various data structures that has latches. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's also overhead. And those are implemented in the user base, not in the kernel level. And those are um, combined together, the things that prevents the system from being like 50 times faster. So how do we solve that? Can we get rid of them? So um, before moving to that, uh, let me uh, emphasize one of the key characteristics of the OLTP workloads, I think we also saw this in this course, is that um, OLTP transactions are short-lived, they are pretty short. Um, so uh, another example from TPCC is that the heaviest transaction uh, in TPCC touches like read and writes about 200 records, and it can be done in about less than one millisecond. So in such um, tra short transactions, you can actually just have a system to run this, all the queries within that transaction sequentially from the beginning to the end. And in those scenarios, more, of more often than not, CPU is not the bottleneck for it. Um, for many times, the network becomes the bottleneck. Um, so after that, so how, how do we solve this problem? Um, the answer uh, is that we come to the um, same conclusion that many you know, crazy Node.js people came to is that run single-threaded. Um, it's not rare, a lot of people do that. Uh, Redis does that too. Um, and it's actually astounding to see what a modern CPU can do if you um, build a special purpose single-thread system. So um, also running a single-thread system uh, has its own benefit because it's very easy to write, right? Everyone starts learning how to program, how to write a program with single-threaded program. You don't start to learn how to write a multi-threading program. And when it comes to the deployment, um, actually, um, it's easy to deploy. It's, co it's cost-effective, right? You can deploy this kind of um, softwares on a uh, low-end machine. It's like you, you, you can have a single core machine to run it. Um, so to put this in perspective in the class, He's basically saying, throw away project one, project two, project three. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's showing here. Who loves, who loves their flash crabbing, right? Don't do it. You don't have to do it. 
Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to see it. So um, with that, you sort of can consider that we solve this, uh, we have to find a way out of the concurrency problem, but not yet. Um, there are two still, uh, there are two still um, remaining issues here. The first issue is that um, waiting on the users um, leaves the CPU idle. What does that mean? If you support Hibernate or uh, if you support what we call a external transaction control, is that uh, you tell the system, okay, now start a transaction. Here are the queries I need to run. Run those queries, give me the result, and I will determine, I will tell you whether to commit this transa transaction or I will abort it. So this is external transaction control. Now, if you're doing things like that, you cannot really run single threaded because you ended up waiting on users to give you an answer, whether to commit or roll back, right? And then you spend a lot of uh, network round trip time on it and the performance cannot be good. You cannot run 50 times faster. Um, the other issue is that um, multi-core is now in the future. I think even your cell phone has multi-core now. And if you have a system like VoDB that's transactional and does um, distributed transactions, you don't really want that system to just run single-threaded. You need to do a little bit more than that to utilize all the multi-cores. Multi so um, how do we solve that? Um, so here reminds you the other um, characteristic of OLTP transactions. Um, actually, this also comes from Andy's course. You probably saw this in the, uh, in the lecture is that um, uh, unlike OLAP transactions, uh, OLAP queries are more ad hoc. You have data analysis sitting in front of the terminal. You have a data in the data warehouse, and you do um, ad hoc queries to explore the data warehouse to discover some interesting trends. That's what OLAP do. But for OLTP transactions, the queries are more um, of a query pattern. It's a more repetitive. For example, if I have a transaction that's transferring some money from one bank account to another, um, the queries that you need to execute, they are written, they don't change. And the order of uh, uh, the query execution also fixed. You have the logical flow, if this, then execute that, if that, then execute, what, blah, blah, blah. So then for the external transaction control, we don't really need that because you know everything in advance. So you can turn this process to tell the system to start a transaction, to commit a report into something that we say is a pre-compiled store procedure that has all the flow control code, the uh, parameterized SQL, because what varies from transaction to transaction is just the parameters. If you transfer an amount of money from one bank account to another, you need to know the uh, account number and the, money, uh, the amount of money you're going to transfer. So that's the ch that's the only change from transaction to transaction. That's the parameters. So, <clears throat> um, the other, um, so for, for the wait on user, the external transaction uh, saying the problem, the solution is that we don't do it. We don't provide the user the ability to start a transaction, run some queries, and commit. And instead, we will move the logic from the client side to the server side. It's like we push the logic to the data. If you use external transaction control because you have introduced this waiting time or uh, the network round trip time, so you have to introduce concurrency to hide that latency and the performance cannot be as good as um, having all the server side logic. So we'll push the logic to data, not the other way around. So how, how, how do we use all the cores on the multi-core system? Definitely I'm gonna, not going to run a system on one single machine, right? Especially because I'm running a in-memory database. If I need a database that has like a capacity of two terabytes, uh, I, I think I probably need a bunch of servers to form a cluster to store that. Um, so partitioning in that case is a requirement. And then, so how do, we, how do we partition that? Do we partition that to the node? Uh, it's better that we partition the data to the cores. So if I have four machines with four cores, I better treat them as like six, uh, 16 tiny little machines um, rather than treat them like four machines and have some shared uh, multiprocessing. So, um, so we view this as uh, concurrency via scheduling, not via um, shared memory. 
So if you look up VoDB on the internet, you see documentations from us, you see, okay, VoDB is single-threaded, and um, VoDB does not have locks. Okay, that sounds confusing. So you don't have concurrency? Uh, it doesn't say that. Actually, um, what we're actually saying is that when you run SQL, uh, SQL queries, when you run SQL queries, those are run without the locks. You don't have shared data structures and you don't have locks. But we do have concurrency code that managed to distribute the uh, query, the transaction, to the right place. So the concurrency is achieved via um, scheduling, not shared memory. We don't have um, those shared data structures uh, once uh, the execution starts. All right. So I crossed out many components here. Uh, one thing that's left, it's um, logging. Um, that's, can, the, that's what everyone's working on now, too. Oh, really? You have the project on logging? Yes, but it, you can't get rid of it. So <laughs> I know they want me to say you can get rid of logging so they don't even care about doing that project, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> there are two parts of the, uh, the logging, right? Um, so the original HStore um, project claimed that um, the durability can be achieved through uh, data replication. So uh, you probably covered, you know, the, uh, the, um, the Red Hat logging, the WAL. Um, so it has, what, what do you store in the, uh, in the Red Hat logging? You store the before values, the after values for redo and undos. So uh, for the in-memory database system, if you have durability through the data replication, you don't need to worry about the redos, actually, um, because you have the, um, the uh, other replicas have that for you. So that can be solved, but what about undo? Running single-threaded, the um, single partition transaction does not mean that you cannot abort a transaction. You still need to have some kind of logging for the redo. So I can take some part of it off, but I need to keep the undo logging. So there's a tiny piece in the execution engine where I keep track of the changes I made in a transaction so that I can, redo, uh, I can undo a um, transaction. All right, that's basically all of it. Then let's just take a final look at what we end up building. So first is in-memory relational SQL database. And there's no external transaction control. We use uh, store procedures. And um, execution engines are single-threaded. And those are run in parallel to use all the cores. And we partition the data to the cores. Uh, and we have concurrency via scheduling, not via um, shared memory. We don't have shared data structures. Um, and the durability, durability is achieved through um, replication, and we have serializable assets. That's the strongest level of um, isolation, the um, serializable isolation. So you run the concurrent transaction as if they are run serially. All right, so let's see um, uh, more concretely uh, what does the system look like. So uh, VoDB is remarkably simple. So clear your own mind with all the complexities, forget about your projects in the database course, and it's kind of a uh, zen moment that we are going to have. So I, I, wanna, I wanted to picture this image together with me. First, it's gonna be an in-memory store. So you have all your data in the memory. And then to operate those data, you have a execution engine, a single-threaded execution engine. So we have the data, we have the engine to manipulate those data. Then I will give it the work queue so that it can have a place to pull off uh, transactions to execute. And then uh, most important part is, uh, as I emphasized, this system run in parallel. You have multiple, this kind of single threaded execution engine. So we have it parallel. So those are partitioned to the cores and those cores can come from the same machine and come from multiple machines. So I'll show you a setting that has two nodes, and it's the dual core machine. I have two sites per host. I have two logical partitions on every node. All right, now I have a table, okay? So if I run, uh, I store this table and I run transaction on the table, and how, how do I access the data? So it depends on how, uh, the data layout, how you store this table. We have two types of tables. The first type is replicate table, which every logical partition has identical copy, the complete copy of that table. So I distribute this copy to all the partitions. Every partition got to the complete data. So in that case, um, to route those read and write requests, I'm gonna have something like a command router. And if I read something from 
uh, replica table, where do I route this query? Everyone has the same copy, so it doesn't really matter where do I route it. So I can just pick one, and so that can serve the read request for a replica table. How do I write? It's more complicated because everyone has the same copy. Then if I write something, then the changes need to go everywhere because we need to make the database in sync. So those changes go everywhere. All the partition got that request to write a replica table. And then you get results, the confirmation, the write was complete, it was successful. So the other type of uh, table is partition table, uh, meaning that uh, you actually partition the data across the cluster. And we have a consistent hash function that calculates. So every table, you need to specify a column as the partition column. In this case, it's the player ID is the partition column of this table. Then I use this hash function to determine the hash value and to tell me which partition uh, any row is going to be routed to. So I, I, um, I represent that as four different colors on the, um, on the graph. So I distribute the data to its corresponding partition. So in this case, I still have this command router. And if I want to do the read, a select query, um, remember that the player ID is the partition column. If I have this select query um, that uh, has this partition column in the filter, say I want to have the information where um, this um, player ID is 687, and you know from the left-hand side which partition it should go to. So the command router calculates the, that hash value and then it will route it to the corresponding partition for the single partition read. And then we will return back the result. So what about single partition writes? It's, it's pretty much the uh, same process. It's just writing, like I have an update query. I want to update. And I, if I have this partition column involved in this query, then um, the router knows where do I route this command to. So you're going to route to the corresponding partition, does the update, and get back to you. All right. So there are times that you don't have uh, the filter. You don't have that uh, partition column involved in the filter. So in those cases, you don't know exactly which one single partition that you're going to execute this command on. So that becomes a multi-partition read. Say, this is an example. Then I don't have the partition column. Then I don't know exactly where to. There's no one single partition I can just execute the complete command. So I route it to every partition. So every partition is going to say, OK, I have this. Let me check if I have any matching rows for you. So two of the partition has matching rows. The other two doesn't. It doesn't really matter. Um, everyone's going to reply with me, with me, uh, uh, re reply me with a message. Um, it, it's okay if it's, it's an empty message. I don't find any matching rows. It's okay. But the router is going to combine it together and going to route it back to you. For multi-partition writes, it's the same idea. You have some queries and you don't know where, which partition to go to. You put it on all partitions and every partition is going to do the write. And then it'll get back to you. It's okay if the response is empty. You don't do anything. But if you do anything, just give me a confirmation. All right. Um, so in the two, um, in the multi-partition um, transaction, actually there are multiple, uh, multiple partitions involved, so actually you cannot just directly return. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a command router that combines the uh, results together and return to the client. Actually, if any of the partition fails, you have to fill the transaction. So there's kind of a two-phase commit, and that actually, um, uh, the, what VoDB adopts, actually, also what HStore adopts is that you block the transaction until everyone finishes, everyone reaches the same point, and then you introduce some stall. That's efficient. For single partition transactions, you receive from the client and the coordinator, the router, gives you the command, and you can just um, queue them sequentially. And you can see, actually, the execution engine is really busy doing all the single, transa single partition transactions. But for a multi-partition multi multi transaction, uh, when, the, when, when the, the router sends out the request, actually, because it's multi-partition, going to send to every partition, um, then every partition is going to send uh, the prepare message after you finish uh, the transaction, say, I'm ready. So um, everything goes well, and they want to commit. And the coordinator needs to get back to the um, partition and say, OK, then let's just commit. So, um, then you need to wait for the network round trip in that case, and that introduces some stall, then it becomes less efficient um, compared to the single partition transactions. 
And actually here we are doing a, um, a earlier acknowledgement. So uh, if everything goes well, if I uh, receive the uh, prepare message, I would just directly return the result while I give the, the um, partitions my confirmation to commit to the transaction. All right. Do people typically run the command router on the same like, machine as the data nodes or the, the, the data system nodes, or is that with a dedicated machine? Uh, that's um, the uh, would be cluster is homogeneous. It's, there's no like um, master node or uh, coordinator node, so everyone can route the. the um, I just do the abstraction to have that router, but everyone can just uh, can do the route routing. All right. So so far, I did not cover anything about durability, that replication part. Um, so in the example I just gave you, um, this database is not durable. So if I have this read transaction, I want to read something, and I know this partition is there, but before I send that request to that partition, that partition just suddenly died. Maybe it's the power failure or whatever. I don't know. Then you don't have that data available. That data is completely lost, <laughs> right? You have to cry because you have no backups, right? So recall um, the uh, multi-partition read. If I read a um, replicate table, and the partition I go to is just suddenly died, can I get the response? I, I can still find another partition to read because everyone has a complete copy. Then I, I'm not that stressed because I have replication. So the similar idea, um, due to space limitation, I reduce this to two partitions. So uh, I can make a complete copy of those two partitions on another node um, so that everyone, uh, so each partition got its replica. Then, um, I have the same query, and then which one do I uh, ask uh, for the data? Uh, in this case, we define the partition leader, um, so this have a master and replica. Then uh, always we always turn to the partition leader uh, if it goes well um, for the data. Um, but in this case, if I uh, make the node two die, then I still I, I found that no do die and cannot respond to my request, then I, I would just turn to the replica for the read. So that's replication. So you saw from Andy's course that uh, it says there are active, active, or active, passive. Um, so will they be used active, active, meaning that you uh, both the, uh, uh, the partition leader and the replica execute the transaction. And we're going to check at the end if the uh, result matches. So this is the illustration of that active active replication. So you execute. So when we uh, route a transaction to the uh, partition leader, we don't route it from the coordinator to that replica. It's actually the partition leader is responsible for routing that replica, that transaction to the replicas for them to execute. And we still have uh, uh, the, the partition leader will wait for the replica to finish, then we can commit the uh, transaction. All right. Um, so if you recall the, uh, the, the diagram for the multi-partition, they also have stalls uh, because you have to wait for the network round trip. So does that mean that um, a single partition with active-active uh, active replication is as bad as uh, a multi-partition transaction? Actually, it's not. In the case safety uh, environment setting, um, so case safety means that uh, if uh, I can tolerate case uh, server loss. So, uh, the normal practice is I, I, I keep actually um, k plus one copies uh, for um, any partition. So actually, uh, the replication of the blocks like k plus one partition because every partition uh, needs to participate in that transaction. But MP, the multi-partition transaction, actually blocks all the uh, partitions. So that's the difference. All right. Um, one thing that I need to emphasize for active-active uh, replication is determinism, is that given a, a same starting state, and if I run a, a command as a SQL query or transaction, um, what I expect is I um, both the master and replica run into the same result. I don't want the data in both locations diverge after running this transaction. That's called determinism. Um, so how do I guarantee that um, you have the same result? There are several factors that um, may uh, cause the data diverge. Uh, one is the query order. So you have, if I have two uh, partition um, which are master and replica, and I, I create a table, both got created, and, and I, I insert a tuple, I insert a row into the database, and then starting from the third query, I have a different order. 
one is inserted into a, a table of value, another one is an update query that updated, updated the data. And then we switch around, then say, I, I will do the update to the end, and this one will do uh, uh, insert to the end. Then, and because the order of execution is different, you end up uh, with different the table content. Then that causes you to diverge the data. The second factor is the tuple order. Uh, same setting, if I create a table and I uh, insert a tuple, and then for the first case, it inserts as the first location, and the second table inserts as the second location. That's totally possible, probably because I just happen to have an available memory spot at that second row location because I just recovered from a uh, memory compaction. It's totally possible. So we don't guarantee that the first row inserted appears at the first row and the second row appears uh, at the second row. So if I continue execution, if I insert another row, it's fine. Both table contains two rows and you have one and two. But the problem arises if I execute some query like delete from table limit one, then the first table say, okay, I can delete the first row. The second table say, yeah, I can do that too. But the row that deleted happened to be different. Then your data diverged again. So that's triple order. So, uh, in VoDB, we enforce the tuple order. Sometimes we give uh, determinism warnings if, you, uh, if, we if we detect your query may have the uh, risk of diverging your data, then we may give warnings. And for those cases, you can just add an order by clause to enforce that ordering so that you can just have a deterministic uh, result. Uh, a last factor is a function determinism. Say, if I, ha if I have a table, um, then I uh, store the timestamp, maybe the produce time, the, the production time. Um, I, want to, I want to uh, insert the current date. Then um, at today midnight, before the project due time, <laughs> right? you insert the current date time. It's, um, it's still 11 p.m., 11.59. So if I insert, then I have December 3rd. But Right at the moment when I uh, forward this request to the replica, then the clock switches. Now it's December 4th. It's 12 a.m. now. Then you end up inserting December 4th. Then the, the data diverge again because you have um, this function um, non-determinism. All right. So in VoDB, we solve this problem by providing uh, some of the functions, uh, the implementations, like the current date and the, the current time, or uh, the random function, the random number, because we can substitute that with uh, something that's deterministic. So actually internally in VoDB, when you um, insert a query, like you execute a query like this, we're gonna translate to something that's constant, so you don't have any confusion between uh, different sites. So actually we guarantee that the result you insert into the database is deterministic. Why couldn't the router just say, this is my current timestamp? This is something. This is something that we do. We we give you some, like for the random function, we give you a C that's identical for all the partitions, and for the current date time, we'll give you the time, so you can insert that. I mean, I mean sort of what you're implying here is you're rewriting the query to make today function be a constant. No, we, we just, we, no, it's not like that. It's not like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I think I think this is also super, this is actually super important, and what makes both DB actually work. So what he's doing here is. The active active replication means that the transaction is going to run on every copy of, of the database that you have on different nodes. And then you don't want to have to coordinate while they're running, right? They're running independently of each other. So all of these, these aspects of non-determinism would cause the two machines that are running independently the same transaction to diverge. So these are the things you need to do to avoid having this problem. So that it's always guaranteed that the database is in the same state when you start it'll be in the same state of both machines when the transaction ends. Yeah. All right, so far we covered um, most, almost all of the part here uh, on the diagram. Uh, we, we leave the essential part as for database operation, and we leave some part of end logging. All right, so um, that basically is the um, architectural overview of the original HStore system. So now let's move on to the next part. So after HStore, was commercialized as VoDB, and what kind of things we had to change, except for the logos. <laughs> <laughs>
there are, there are so many logos, it's kind of surprising that a startup company has so many logo changes. And um, I, I joined VoDB um, as intern in 2015, and I came back as full-time engineer in 2016. And I, I, I only saw the, um, the red one on the top left and this one, and the other three are predates me. Um, but Ruth saw many more than me. Um, so the first thing that we have to change is the um, disk durability because no one's really interested in a real completely in-memory OLTP system because they don't feel safe. Like they don't believe it that, well, you can do that just by active, active replication. Um, so that's a huge gap between the theory and, and the reality, how people believe things and how you advocate things. Um, so what we built into the system was command logging. Um, it's as part of the disk durability. Um, so what we do is that we actually logs the commands that we execute, that we send to the um, partition to execute. We log that command to disk to, do, uh, to make that durable. Um, because um, I, I emphasize that this determinism is very important in VoDB query execution. So also benefit from that, because you have a same starting day, a state, and you run this uh, command log, if you replay from the command log, if you have the same starting state, you're going to end up with the same ending data. You, then you can um, bring your um, database to the latest state. Um, also, we utilize this um, serializable isolation as a performance trick, not a performance compromise. Command logging is logical logging. You're not logging the SQL query, you're logging the name of the store procedure. Think of like you're logging the functions you invoke. And then within that function, it invokes a bunch of SQL statements. Yeah. So you, I can just log a procedure one, but that may contain like a thousand SQL queries. But all I record is just the name of that uh, store procedure. So why do we log the command, not the changes? Um, because it, it has bounded size. So you only have the parameter name and the um, list of parameters that you're going to pass to. Um, so you can imagine how fast this is by um, comparing the disk I/O throughput and the uh, network bandwidth. So when we compare memory and disk, when we say memory is super fast, it's faster than the disk. But how, how's the result if you compare disk throughput with the, IO, uh, the network bandwidth? So basically, you can actually record uh, as many requests as you want as you receive from the network. You have this um, um, ability to record, record all those um, commands to the disk. Um, however, if you just record the changes, I can just change uh, within the transaction, a million tuples, and that will be a tremendous amount of updates you need to log. And also, um, another point for that is about latency. So let's take a look. If you use write ahead lock, uh, you need to um, start to log, and you need to wait until um, the execution finished, because you need to log the before and after add value for redo and undos. But for commands, well, the commands doesn't change after you execute the query. The commands are commands. So I'll move it to the left side, because I don't need to wait for the execution result to have the after values. I can just directly, uh, once I receive the command, I can just give it to the command log and just log it, right? And also, this is synchronous command logging. If I want to be more aggressive, I can make it asynchronous command logging. So uh, you don't need to check if the command landed on disk, it's flush disk, before you can just return to the client. You can just, because you don't care or you care that less about that, then you can use asynchronous logging, but it can give, still give you um, this uh, to the disk. What percentage of the customer is wrong with asynchronous? Well, Bruce answered that. <laughs> Most of them. Most of them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so if you overlap with this execution, then it's also a kind of pipeline process to have this uh, asynchronous uh, command logging. But we also created a, uh, oops, oh, this is not the up-to-date one. So we also created the back pressure mechanism in case that you run too fast on the transaction and uh, it's giving a disk a hard time to uh, catch up. So we also have the pre back pressure uh, from the command logging to the execution engine to um, slow down and wait for me. All right. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also have something called uh, the snapshot, because checkpoint snapshot. Because at some point, you don't want to, uh, if you, the, the database crashes and start up again, you don't want to replay like several millions transactions or tens of millions transactions. That takes a long time. 
Um, instead, uh, we're going to truncate this uh, command log periodically by doing a snapshot, meaning you dump all the table content was stored in the database to the disk. So that um, it's our, those two mechanisms are combined together. So you have periodic snapshots that takes the full snapshot of your database. And then, because it's periodic, once uh, if your database crashes and then start up again, uh, what you do is you just look for the most recent snapshot and restore the content because it's tr the, the command log is truncated um, from the point uh, from the point that the snapshot is being taken. Then you first restore the snapshot. It gives you all the tuples in the database. Then you start to replay command log after that. That gives you back to the uh, most recent state in the database. Uh, uh, in a snapshot, we have something called uh, this is my own name. I call it two version control, two version concurrency control, because once you start a snapshot, then um, the part of you are going to read for snapshotting um, may still be changed by queries, but you don't want to uh, have that directly flush to the snapshot. Then uh, we, we created what called copy on write context. Uh, you can you can treat it as a uh, two-version concurrency control instead of multi-version concurrency control so that you keep a uh, original state of that um, data before the snapshot point. Um, then after the snapshot is being finished, they can be merged together. All right. Um, the second thing that we add uh, to the WooDB system is um, cross data center replication. So. So far, the replication, the active, active replication we talked so far uh, is within the database for durability. Um, then, if you think about this restarting process, if I start, a, start up the database, for disk-oriented space uh, uh, database, you have all the data in, in the, um, on the disk, and you just replay the, the logs. Um, it's considerably a smaller amount of time. But if you have terabytes of data, or even just tens of gigabytes of data, and you restart, uh, and restore from the snapshot. It's going to take a while, and sometimes people say, "I don't want that long um, restore time. Uh, can I just have a standing by cluster that it can promote anytime if the primary cl cluster failed?" So uh, another use case for this is that uh, if I have, if I'm operating a bank and I have branches in the U.S. and I have a branch in the in China, say in Beijing, and uh, if I make a cash withdrawal from a branch in Beijing. I don't want to have that long waiting time, the round trip time. It's about like a 200 milliseconds latency um, between the communication from uh, the Beijing to maybe Washington. Um, so I want to have um, geo sparse uh, um, data centers that it can just serve um, requests are close to me. So those are the two main uh, use cases for um, the cross data center replication. So we build that. And we support active, active, and active, passive. Uh, active, active in this case means uh, both clusters, the primary and the replica, can accept transactions. You can make cash withdrawals from Beijing and route it to the Beijing data center. And you can make cash withdrawals from Washington and route it to, um, you can go to the, uh, the Washington data center. All right. Uh, this is the diagram for that. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we also have a conflict. Um, uh, resolution scheme um, because if if you're um, if I'm withdrawing caches from um, from US and my parents using my cards uh, to withdraw caches from my bank account in Beijing then um, both sites are going to try to uh, modify the data of my own account which should be uh, on a one single partition then I may result into uh, a conflict here um, so in this case um, we Timestamp that the uh, all the transactions accepted uh, at two data centers, and we actually log them if the uh, conflict uh, occurs, and you can uh, refer back. You can um, resolve that at a uh, application level to resolve that conflicts. And um, in the database, always the last update succeeded. All right. Um, the third problem that we had to make changes is the memory fragmentation. Actually, this although I listed it on the third item, I, I don't have any sequence uh, like I don't have any order for all those items. Uh, this one actually, if you look on the temporal axis, it actually happens at the very beginning uh, when we, after as soon after we had this first customer, uh, we run into this memory uh, fragmentation issue because the customer say, well, I start a database and run my business, and over time, I, I didn't have so much more data. I just run um, 
I just run transactions, but you are for taking much and much more memories. And even if I truncate the data or delete some of the data, I don't see the memory consumption drops. I don't see the shrink on the memory usage. So um, that makes, it, makes us to think about um, the memory compaction because over time, oh yes. Yeah. So you mentioned that you, you use a timestamp to solve the conflict. Yeah. How did you get the conflict? Repeat the question. Uh, so he asked if, uh, if I use the timestamp to resolve the conflicts and how, how do we get to the timestamps. Um, so we have, I think we have the, the NTP service to across data centers and uh, you cannot guarantee that the timestamps you get from two data centers are identical and they're always precise. There are always some offsets. Um, so. As I said, when the conflict occurs, we just tag the, um, the trans, uh, transaction with the current timestamp from that data center, and then we will tag it to the binary log for the DR, and actually it's going to log, and we cannot uh, resolve that automatically for you, although we will let the uh, most recent, most, uh, the latest uh, update to succeed and make another one fail, but we log both changes. And it's at the ap application level where you address those um, conflicts. Yeah, you can actually access all conflict resolutions in a log and write and write reconciliation logic. Yeah. Because you're right, both data centers will not be totally synchronized. Right. You can you cannot expect. Okay, I have timestamps from uh, data center A and B, and they are totally in sync without any um, precision loss, and there are always some offsets. All right, back to the uh, memory compaction. Um, so uh, there are two uh, things that we did in the system. Uh, for the triple, triple storage part, uh, we actually bucketed the, uh, the blocks um, according to their uh, occupancy. Um, here, due to space limitation, I only showed four buckets actually uh, in the system. There are 20 of them. Um, so we classify, um, classify all those blocks for the table into those 20 buckets uh, in terms of the occupancy. Um, so uh, when a transaction commits, we always try to say, well, do I reach a threshold for a compaction? If I do, um, then I would just like say, in this case, I would just take the, um, the bucket for the 20% full and merge it with the 80% full buckets. And for the index, because we use tree indexes, um, whenever we remove a tuple uh, from the index, we always try to re re um, swap with the uh, element that was at the end of the index and we try to rebalance it. All right. Um, this is a um, more recent issue that we try to resolve, is shared replica table. Uh, this is also coming from the field. A lot of customers complain about it. It's also because, uh, as I said, multi-cores and now in future is going to develop more and more. A lot of the servers got 32 cores and even 48 cores, example from my other customer. So um, it, it gives, um, it gives you um, a more uh, free space. It saves a lot of space, but um, also at the same time increase a lot of the engine complexity. So the scenario is like this. If I have a replica table, so for replica tables, sometimes we store maybe uh, lookup tables or dimension tables, or for many times we just, we just make the tables that are less frequently updated, replicated. So, for many use cases, for many of our customers, we have a lot of replica tables, and that concerns them in a very uh, high core configuration. If I replicate this table, and this is the example configuration from the customer, they have a lot of cores in their machine, and each partition needs to have a complete copy of this replica table. That space consumption adds up very, very quickly, and you see, if I have only 100 megabytes of data, and if you times all those nodes, all those sites per host, you end up storing a huge amount of repeated data, even on the same machine, because you have so many cores. So in this case, what we did was, let's just make it different. I don't want every partition to store a complete copy of this replica table. Instead, I only let each node store a complete copy of this replicate table data. That dramatically drops the memory consumption from replicate table and makes um, 
a lot more things can happen. All right, in this case, how do I, how do I write to a um, table that's share replicated? Uh, sorry, this is not the latest version. <laughs> Uh, uh, I made some changes on the fly. I, I, maybe some, somehow this didn't propagate it. So um, you see on the left-hand side, every, uh, there are four engines. Every engine got one copy of it. Actually, it's not only the lowest side. Only one of the sites is going to one copy of that um, data. So if I write to any of the, if I write to a replica table, I have a, uh, I have a query that writes to the replica table. I will still broadcast this transaction, but not all the sites are going to run it. For the non-lowest site partitions um, marked as uh, dashed blue arrows, they actually do nothing. They will just return. Only the lowest site, um, the one that's marked as uh, pointed by the purple arrows, they're going to do the update and they're going to return back to you as if all the partition finished that transaction. Well, there are cases that they didn't work well. We actually spent a lot of, a ton of time fixing all the bugs caused by this because um, for some reasons, uh, it may from the snapshot pass or it may from command log pass or it may from DR pass, whatever. Uh, I don't recall the exact reason. There are, there are tons of it. Um, all those partition do not enter because you need to make sure that all the sites come to the same point. Uh, when they receive that um, write request, then the lowest site can start to write it. So there, uh, we introduce a latch there in the execution engine so that it's not for concurrency control, it's just because we want to synchronize all the partition to the same story point. So there are latches there. And so the code is like, um, I, every time I, I receive this log, um, write request, I enter execution engine and I'll count down that latch. And then I will do a if statement if I'm the lowest side and the chosen one, I'm chosen one to accomplish this mission, then I would do some write. Well, but sometimes for some reasons, not all the sites can get to this countdown latch and sometimes they fall asleep or they're dreaming or something. So the normal working sites were like, I'm counting on this latch, I'm waiting for it to come to zero and can do some work. And the other transactions say, okay, those four transactions, those four partitions are working on something, let's just wait. Like I, I, don't, I don't even uh, assign any uh, new transactions for that sleeping partition, then you end up stuck in, 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 stuck in this in execution engine. And the current transaction cannot succeed because you're waiting on the countdown latch. And new transaction cannot come in because, say, you're busy. I, I, I won't assign you a new task because you're single-threaded. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of romance stories. <laughs> Sorry, she said long running transaction. You say what? What? Dreaming off? What is the f you mean from? Huh? <laughs> you mean what I drew? <laughs> yeah, like, like, is it to another engine? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're kind of dating or something. I don't know. Okay. So to make something up, it's like, oh, what, what, can, <laughs> what can we do? Like, um, I would assume that that partition has some long running transaction that is not really the best <laughs> okay. yeah. partition. But it's a different or it may be on the verge of failing. It is also, it, it seems to be with another gear that's a different color. <laughs> 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 all, <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on. <laughs> all right. Another problem with this is the, uh, the, context, the memory context switch. Um, this especially com becomes complicated if you have operation that involves both partition tables and replicate tables. Say if I have a partition table, I call it P, and I replicate, uh, replicate, replicate table called R. Now I have a query. I want to join these two table. I want to join a replicate table with a partition table. How, how do I do it? If I am the lowest site, I'm the one that I'm the chosen one to accomplish some significant mission. I have this data for the replicate table, and I have the data for the current partition table in my partition. I can do the join in a normal way, but what about the other partitions? I don't have that <coughs> replicate table data because it's in the other partition. <clears throat> in order to join that table, I need to switch my memory content. I need to access the memory space of the other partition. I need to access the data stored in that partition to get my data from the replicate table. 
that context switching stuff is another cause, another root of evil. We also spend a ton of time um, making, sh making sure everything goes right. It's not that difficult by itself, it's especially complicated when it comes into play with all the other components, major components like the durability, importer, exporter, DR, et cetera, all these things. When everything comes into play, it's very hard. Is this an engineering thing, or is this something more scientific? Like, are, uh, like, are the engines running the same process? I think yes. Right? Yes. So it just it is technically just a pointer, right, to another location in memory. Yeah, it's kind of um, just need to make sure that you track this context right in all scenarios. Okay. It's not that researchy topic. Like, how do they do it right? They come up with an efficient algorithm. It's not like that. All right. The next part is uh, materialized views is something that enables some of the part, uh, some of the streaming capabilities of VoDB. Uh, is that um, if I have this scenario that um, I have fixed the uh, network, networking overhead, and I have some um, transaction overhead, scheduling overhead, etc. So imagine a scenario that I have a table that um, accepting incoming tuples. I insert tuples all the time at some speed, like um, 500k per second, and at the same time I need to maintain a dashboard or something like the query shown above on the top of the screen. I need to maintain a dashboard or something. All right. Um, and from time to time, I'm going to query the dashboard and say, give me the result of dashboard. I want to see the current result of the latest result. Um, so when it comes to inserting tuples into memory, actually, the memory read and write is extremely fast. Um, they came almost for free. You, take, you pay very little overhead for writing a new tuple to uh, the uh, in-memory table. But, Executing an aggregation function, a query with aggregate functions like this, actually requires to scan a lot of tuples on the table. And that pays a lot of overhead if you run this um, dashboard query from time to time very frequently. So uh, what we did is that we introduced something called uh, materialized view as the first class citizen in VoDB. We've got a very good support for it. Is that when you add that tuple in memory, I also make another update in the memory to update the materialized view. A lot of the aggregate functions are distributed, meaning that like for, for the sum or, um, or the count, when you get the new tuple, you just increase the amount of count. You increment the count by one, and you can increment that sum by the value. And when you delete a tuple, you just decrement that amount. Then that's distributive. Um, and there are some that are not distributive, like min and max, then when you have a new tuple comes in, you can just calculate which is the uh, smallest, which is the largest, and when you delete the tuple, then you just use the index to find the next uh, largest or next the smallest one to update the view. So uh, we have another minimal operation attached to it that's not a lot of overhead. Then whenever you need to query that dashboard and you need to get a result, instead of running that um, query all over again, you just query the uh, materialized view table. It's a specialized table that we maintain in the memory that user cannot modify, but we can update internally. So reflect uh, always up to date result for that particular query. Um, also, uh, one of the major work I did after I joined a company was adding some support for drawing queries, meaning you have the query. This is just for from uh, the aggregation from one particular table, but you can actually create materialized view from drawing two or three tables. Of course, the performance is going to go very bad if you join a lot of queries in the materialized view because you're going to maintain the up-to-date result every time you update, update the table. Um, but there are cases it's good for it. Um, next thing is the import export. Um, so <clears throat> a lot of things come similar to stream processing. If you do very fast transaction processing, then it starts to smell like stream processing. Um, and to have real time understanding of your data also has always have some values. People are interested in seeing. You should define which stream processing. Um, the stream processing is that you have um, the incoming data ingested into a, uh, ingested to your system in a very fast rate, and um, those can trigger some. Um, you can you can imagine like you have some data inputs from sensor networks or some other networks, like Internet of Things, and you can have very fast uh, ingestion data, and that triggers some kind of uh, processing. Like you need to uh, summarize to uh, summarize, have a digest of that stream, or you need to take some actions triggered by that ingestion action. So that all kind of um, stuff is to process a fast-moving data. 
if you know Kafka, it's Kafka. Yep. Thank you for that. That's helpful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so in Vault, um, we built a series of different uh, importer exporters. You can actually also build your custom importer exporters to uh, take in that ingest data and do some processing. In that case, uh, you can uh, do some processing inside the database after the data is ingested. And then you can push it downwards to maybe a OLAP system downwards to do um, data warehousing. Uh, the last one we add is more SQL support. Um, uh, Vault was criticized of, uh, by its lack of support of uh, standard SQL. We have some basic SQL uh, in the initial phase and when we started to uh, started from the HStore project. Uh, over the years, we added more and more SQL support. Actually, if you run a no SQL system, no one's gonna criticize for you the lack of SQL support, but you say, I'm a uh, SQL database, and they start to criticize you. Yeah, you don't have this. Who's they? <laughs> Who's criticizing? <laughs> Um, actually, I, 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 I even faced that kind of question myself when I visit my co the customers. I say, oh, we can do this in MySQL, I can do this in Oracle, but why don't I have to rewrite it? You should support that, right? You make my life miserable. And I have is, it, to... so is it the dialect of SQL or is it the SQL functionality? The SQL functionality. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of things we added uh, to the system. Uh, we added uh, user-defined functions. We added common table expressions. Um, uh, I just list a couple of them, and we have um, a very large project internally to uh, replace the planner to get uh, better uh, plans. That's all in progress. We will cover CalSite in the advanced class next semester. Oh, great. You got something to sign up for next semester. <laughs> all right. Uh, so the final part, uh, I will just uh, briefly, uh, because I, I don't think I have much time, uh, I'll briefly cover some of the new research directions. So everything you know about a store engine, uh, the single threaded, um, uh, this execution part, it's the core of this family of research. You have very fast OLTP transaction engines. The research is just to make them better. They'll have good uh, capabilities for other things like stream processing. So we will cover three parts here, there are more. Um, stream processing is one, and then uh, we, we talked about the uh, inefficiency of, of uh, multi-part transaction because you have to wait for the network tr round trip time because you have to block the transaction uh, while, uh, before the, it finishes. So <clears throat> how, how, do we, how do we make that better? Uh, it's one of the research topics. Also, uh, uh, for the in-memory database, uh, there's always the question about um, what happens if I have data sets that are bigger than the memory? If I start off with a memory database, it works fine, and over the years my, my business grows exponentially, and I suddenly find that I have a huge data set that cannot fit in memory easily, then what do I do? So there's research on that. So, um, so the stream processing part, uh, there was a research prototype after uh, HStore, uh, it called uh, the SStore. Um, so that addresses some of the problems that VoDB um, or each store didn't have. Uh, introduce some more uh, new uh, constructs that's specifically designed for the streams. Um, because you, you, they introduced them kind of what we call window, you also see this kind of similar concept in our database systems. Um, so I, I don't want to this uh, process or this, um, this work, I work on this on indefinite streams. I want to have some uh, interest, the, the window that I'm interested, like the last 10 minutes or, or even some certain number of rows um, last updated. Um, also, the, while the uh, data ingestion happened and you need to have some triggers to trigger some corresponding processing of the actions that you're gonna take. And in VoDB, when you schedule a single partition transaction, actually you don't, uh, we don't guarantee that order. Like if you schedule transaction T1, T2, and T3, um, on the execution engine, it doesn't necessarily um, be the fact that you receive those transactions like T1, T2, and T3. In a single thread, in, in a single partition transaction, you might end up in executing T2, T1, and T3. So you cannot uh, assume that the order that you queue that uh, SQL query in your client application is exactly in the order that you receive and execute in a single uh, stranded engine. So um, they introduced what they call workflow that has some um, dependency on the transactions. You, you make sure that um, you, you define a kind of workflow that happens exactly as you expected for the stream processing. And also, uh, they have a way to expire tuples. Um, they have the tuple TTL, which we also introduced in VoDB version 8.2. 
Uh, this is uh, the larger than memory data management. Uh, there are times that you can have a larger than memory data set or if you just don't have uh, machines that are equipped with a very large amount of memory. So what do you do? So um, more often than not, you can always identify two, part, um, two uh, kinds of data. The code data that's touched less in the transaction paths and the hot data that are more popular in the transaction system. So um, with that observation, you're going to have a serious approach to uh, form a workflow to deal with that. So um, there, there are ways to identify hot tuples and, and code tuples by um, collecting and sampling and analyzing the transaction workload. And you can evict the, the code tuples to disk. You, don't, you can foresee that you don't need this, uh, these tuples in a short amount of time in the future. So you don't need that in the memory for immediate use. You can evict them to the uh, disk. Uh, then it comes to the question, when do you evict that? And do you have a threshold or something? Or, um, or how, how do you track those evicted tuples? And do you have uh, some uh, special data structures to track those uh, tuples that are gone and they went to disk? Uh, and when do you retrieve those tuple back if they were ever referenced by any transactions? I need them back. Then when do you, when do you retrieve them back? And do you retrieve the tuple you need or you just retrieve the entire block that tuple was resided in. And, and when, you, when, you, when you retrieve that tuple, uh, sort of address the problem of where to store that tuple. Do you immediately put the tuple back to the original place it was held in memory, or you held it in a, in, a, in a separate location and merge it to the um, main tuple storage at a later time? So there, yes? From, from what? Buffer pool? Oh, so his question is that uh, how this um, uh, larger than uh, memory data management is uh, different from the buffer pool that we have in the disk-based uh, database system. So uh, I, I would say um, they came off the different architectural designs. So the buffer pool is just for the disk-based disk database system. You, your big assumption is that um, the majority of your data resides in the, on a disk, and the, the, the mission of your buffer pool is that you manage the pages very well so that uh, you minimize the disk assets if they are not necessary. But this actually comes with a different thinking in mind, is that the majority, the vast majority of the data is still in memory, that's hot data, but you just put some of the data that you don't need in the near future to the disk to free some memory space. So they actually, they actually, they work in a similar way. You're swapping tuples from between the memory and the disk, but they came up from the very different thinking behind. So buffer pool does caching. The data, you, you, you bring hot data from disk into memory. Anti-caching, which he's talking about, is the reverse of that. You, everything starts in memory, but you take, move cold data out the disk. Conceptually, the same, but how you architect that system is different. Right. So there are a lot of implementations. Um, there's the famous uh, anti-caching. Famous is not the right word, but... <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I think yeah. I'm well aware of that paper a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's for me. Um, so we have uh, the anti-caching. A lot of other systems also do that, like the um, in-memory version of SQL Server, the Hackathon. Um, maybe there are many more. I, I, I don't, I cannot remember all the names, but there are just a few of them. So that's for larger than memory data management. And now, <clears throat> um, those are the things, this is smarter scheduling. So if I end up having to um, block, the, um, block the, uh, the, the partitions, can I do better? Um, the, to solve this multi-partition transaction problem, you maybe, either way, uh, either you handle it from the data perspective, you partition the data better, or the other way around, you cannot change much the partition scheme, how do I, um, schedule a little bit better, or I can do both. So smart scheduling is uh, it's some of that. Um, so there are many ways, um, many uh, kind of optimizations. Um, the most they come from uh, Andy's paper, and you, if you're interested, you can take a look. Um, actually, one of them is actually we have a prototype for it. It's the second one, the end partition instead of all partition, meaning that instead of blocking all partitions, uh, I can get an understanding like which exactly uh, are the partitions out of all the partitions that you're gonna use. Like if I have four partitions, maybe my transaction, um, although cannot run single single partition, I can only use, I will only use two of them. 
So I will only lock two of them. I can let go the other two. I can they can they can do other stuff, or uh, I I can I can just deliver this uh, transaction to the data heavy node because there are data exchanges uh, between the partitions if you have a multi-partition transaction. Uh, for example, if you have a distributed um, sort or join, you need to um, shuffle some data from one to the other. So if I make the data heavy node as the coordinator, then most of the time I'm just retrieving some lightweight data from the other nodes, but I have the most heavy, the heaviest one on myself. I don't need to transfer it on the, on the, internet, uh, on, on, on the network. Um, so there's also a, uh, optimization for dis disable and do logging for uh, transactions that do not need to abort. Um, that's only for, that's, that doesn't help much for the multi-part transaction because it's really hard to say. Um, this uh, speculative uh, concurrency control is that the idea is that, well, if I'm waiting for um, the coordinator to give me the feedback, whether you can commit or you need to abort, um, while I spend my time waiting there, why don't I just go ahead and execute some other transaction that's are unlikely to overlap with the current multi-partition transaction that I, I execute? If I can have luck, then it turns out after the commit that um, the, the data I, I, I touched in this uh, followed a speculative execution does not have any impact on the multi-partition transaction result, and I just cheated and I have, I have the, I have the um, more efficiency. But if I'm out of luck, then I just have some cascaded rollback and have a port series, uh, a board series of um, single part transactions. Uh, another part is um, um, important for this paper is that the, um, uh, the use of the Markov model to make prediction to forecast the behavior of the stop procedure, uh, which partition gonna, is more likely they're gonna touch and how do we choose the optimization for it. Um, the smarter partitioning. <clears throat> so this is the other half of this problem. So instead of do better scheduling, I just make uh, the partitioning uh, better. So, um, so in this paper, um, there is a, a search algorithm called uh, the large neighborhood search. Um, so we sample the workload, um, get an idea how um, this uh, transaction touches this data, and we come up with some better um, partitioning uh, scheme. And this paper also introduced a replicated secondary index, meaning that, well, if I am well, running a, a multi-part transaction, uh, or, or, or no, sorry, I'm running a single part transaction that involves another table, well, if I join two, join two tables, but the table I'm accessing, the other table I'm accessing, is not partitioned on the same join key, so I need to have remote access to the other part of data. But if I know that in the head, I can create a secondary replicate index that has um, you can, you can consider this as a, a projection in Vertica. You have some columns data in the replicated um, secondary index, so everyone has a copy of it. If I execute that kind of query, instead of going out and look for the data from the other nodes, I can just uh, execute locally with that secondary index. Um, to a, a step um, to further than that is the uh, e-store, it's the elastic partitioning. Uh, the idea is that um, if I can have some pattern of my workload, the fluctuation of my workload. Maybe um, before Thanksgiving, it's, it's kind of quiet and, and reach the peak uh, at Thanksgiving and access some pattern, uh, some data with some pattern. Then how do, I, uh, how do I solve this? I can just responsively, uh, res uh, responsibly um, shuffle the data online. So it introduced the two-tier partitioning. In addition to the hash partition, hash value partition, the hash ring, um, you can partition some most frequently accessed data, the hot tuples, in another way. It's one-to-one -one mapping. I can have another um, um, partitioning scheme for that. So I will monitor the workload on a tuple level, and I will just come up with a tuple replacement plan, and I will shuffle those hot tuples. So the partition, the database is not strictly partitioned by that hash function that you determined, the hash um, partition column you determined. Instead, uh, on top of that, you have a, another auxiliary mechanism that you can shuffle the partition based on the hotness they are touching the transaction. All right, um, that wraps up um, the, all the contents. Um, so today we talked about some history of HStore and VoDB. Um, 
some key design decision questions. How, how, how do we design that? And the uh, architectural overview, especially we emphasize on the partitioning scheme, uh, how tables are replicated or partitioned. And we also talk about share, part uh, share replicated to resolve that uh, memory consumption issue. Um, and we talked about when it, in research product comes into industrial world, um, how do people see it? Like this, uh, the, the disk durability, right? You have to add disk durability, otherwise people don't feel safe. And a lot of other enterprise features that we added to complete that product. In the final uh, phase, we, we talk about briefly um, some research front end, uh, follow that research. Um, if you're interested, uh, interested uh, you can just find all those papers online on the each door homepage. Uh, there are a lot of things actually I'm really interested in. And, and I, I feel very, I've already been having innovation weeks actually this week. We have uh, this week with no engineering assignments that you can pick any project you're interested to work on. It's, it's also a lot of things I, I, I wanted to, 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 to explore a little bit. Um, it's very, very interesting. But someone could explore as part of the internship, correct? Or right, of course. Yeah. 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 So uh, I'm ready to take any questions if you have. All right, let's thank him. All right, time for a few questions. Yes. So he, her, her question was, who is Andrew Pavlo? And I want Andrew Pavlo to raise his hand. Okay, look. <laughs> you, either, so, so you either hate this course or you love this course. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why this course exists is because of HDOR. I got this job at CMU because of HDOR, right? So what can I tell you? So, again, depending whether you love the course, you love the course and you love HDOR. If you hate me and you hate the course, then you hate both of me and you hate HDOR. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. If I had to do it all, all over again, I would have put Andy Pablo on my name and I would have put like a fake middle initial, like AX Pablo or something like that. Right? Yeah. So, any real questions? <laughs> So what's the hardest thing having to work on an MRE database? So these guys have been struggling the entire semester working on their disk-based database. Now there's issues with the grading scripts and let's ignore that, right? But like, mm -hmm. From an engineering standpoint, what's the hardest aspect, what's the hardest thing you have to be aware of when working on an MRE database? I'll say... Um, yeah, keep my question. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for reminding me that. So uh, uh, Andy's question was, what was the hardest thing that I ever worked uh, uh, on this in-memory database uh, from the engineering standing point? Um, I'll say, um, I actually talked about the, this, this thing that's um, giving us a hard time is the share replicated when you start to change the things that you think, oh well, um, what was originally planned doesn't work well in some uh, reality, uh, some cases in reality, like um, the share replicated taking too much memory or even the disk durability issue that we have to build the command logging. That's how you figure out, because we leave out so many things. We don't have logs that we added for share replicated for latching. And we don't have um, this. This um, uh, we don't. We don't. We don't have this. Uh, this a lot of things that we added later. That's uh, we don't have MVCC. We don't have concurrency control. But we have to start to think about it uh, when we start to work on command logging because you you have to have two versions at least. So although two version concurrency control is a lot easier, but it's still something that we need to add back or to some extent. Yeah. Yes. Real quick. Uh, so in one of the slides, you mentioned that there might be some query disordering, but I will, I'm wondering why. I think you should, the, the router should send all of the query uh, together to the node based on some networking protocol, like TCP, which is reliable, I think. So why there is disorder for the query? So his question is, uh, in one of my slides I showed, uh, especially for us, uh, it's for the determinism. Uh, I said one of the things that's very important is the, uh, the query order. If you run out of order, then your data will run out of consistency. Uh, so his question was, why uh, in what circumstances uh, you can have uh, un, um, out of order queries? Um, so in many cases, uh, there might be packet drops and you, you don't have that reliable network or um, 
you can, in, if you think about the uh, data replication uh, scenario I talked about in the slides, um, if I replicate this transaction to something, uh, some other data centers, they actually, and during this process, they, might, they, they may not be transferred exact, in exactly the same order as they were originally planned. So um, I, I cannot give you a very concrete example. I give it too. Yeah? Yeah, if you have non-determinism in the store procedure, right? The store procedure, again, we, we talked about this with like PLPG seal, you can have if clauses. Oh, yes. So if you have if, if today equals Monday, execute this query, else yeah, that's a good point. execute that query. So if the two clocks are in sync, one guy thinks it's Tuesday, one guy thinks it's Monday, and you're f***ed, right? So they avoid all that by sort of preceding all the random number generators and the, the dates yeah. before if, when the transaction begins. If you use Java run function, say, if random number mode, one, mode 2 equals 1, I queue this query, or else I queue that query, then you may have some, you have to out of order from the origin, the source. All right, let's thank him again. Thank you, everyone. All right, again, I'm biased because of HDR, but whatever. <laughs> MultiDB is open source, it's GPL license, it's Java plus C++, so there's a community version if you want to play with it. But it's a little bit more tricky than a sort of MySQL or SQLite because you have to write these store procedures. There is, a, there is a terminal, you can write queries to it, but that's not the way you actually want to run this. Okay? All right, guys. So, on Wednesday, we're going to have the system potpourri. Uh, we have a shocking development. There is actually a new system at the top. So, this is different than every other year. So, I'm excited to see what you guys think about that. Uh, and then, we'll do also the final review at the beginning of the course. And then, I'll post the practice final exam on, on the website later this week. Okay? All right, guys. Good luck with the rest of your classes. Thank you. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Yes, it's the S T Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here comes Duke. I play the game where there's no rules. The homies on the cut, so y'all yeah, fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a four. Six pack 48 gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>